Hey, good afternoon, uh, everyone. I suppose it's afternoon uh, for most of us here. Uh, welcome. This is um, uh, our uh, second event in the Living Heritage in Saskatchewan sharing series for the, uh, the fall term. I am Jérôme Manasso. Um, I'm the Special Advisor to the Vice President Research at the U of R regarding the Living Heritage Research Cluster. Um, over the past few months, um, with the help of the Humanities Research Institute, we created this series um, to help uh, develop research and partnerships around living heritage. Um, so with this series, the hope is to bring together um, people from the university and um, the broader community um, to offer uh, everybody a chance here to uh, know more about the work that's being done around living heritage and get rid of all those silos that our institutions create for us. Um, so we're alternating this year between university and um, NGO, our community uh, presenters, uh, so that we can have a larger variety of, of perspectives and help each of us um, deepen our understanding of what living heritage and intangible cultural heritage are and can be. So I want to acknowledge uh, before we get started that um, I'm hosting this event on the traditional territory of the Nehiyawak, uh, the Anishinaabek, the Dakota, Lakota, and Nakoda, um, and on the homeland of the Métis, which is also Treaty 4 territory. The U of R also has a presence on Treaty 6, and I know that many of you are located there as well. Um, just to note that we are recording this event, that we'll be sharing it on the U of R's YouTube channel. Um, if you don't want uh, your uh, image to uh, appear, you are welcome to leave your camera off and uh, ask your questions via the chat. Our uh, presenter today uh, is Dr. Rebecca Keynes. Um, she is an artist and improv improvisation uh, scholar, an associate professor in the creative technologies in the Faculty of Media Art and Performance. She has been leading socially engaged art projects in sound art and performance for over 20 years in Australia, Northern Ireland, Canada, China, and the Netherlands. She's also the director of the Regina Improvisation Studies Center at the U of R, which is one of six sites in the, of the National Shirk Partnership, the International Institute for Critical Studies in Improvisation. She's a co-editor of Spontaneous Acts, the Improvisation Studies Reader, uh, published with Rutledge in 2014, and she publishes in journals in critical studies in improvisation, interdisciplinary studies, performance studies, global studies, and participatory art and research. She's currently working on the book for Temple University Press for a series in subordinate spaces, which is a wonderful series names, by the way. Um, and today she'll be sharing on uh, an, an ongoing project. So we, we get a bit of, a, of an early look at this project called Multiplay Improvised Art Practice as Living Heritage. And I'll let Rebecca do the rest of the talking, hopefully slower than me. Hi, thanks so much for that introduction, Jerome, and thanks everyone for joining uh, for this talk today. I'm actually delighted to see so many of the people who are engaged in these projects that I'm talking about here, and so many of you making time when it's so stressful. And I really want to thank the University of the Living Heritage Cluster and the Humanities Research Institute for putting this really great series on. I've been attending the talks and really inspired by all the work that people are doing. So just before I start, I, uh, I just want to explain that I am going to use a, speak to a PowerPoint because this project has quite a lot of pieces <laughs> and I think a visual guide will, will keep us on track. Um, I also want to, uh, as Jerome said, this project is in process. So I won't be talking about outcomes, but I'll be talking about ideas and motivations and processes. Um, and on that point, the project is also co-created by a whole range of artists, some of whom who are here today. And so I can't speak on their behalf about their work. I'll do a brief summary, um, but they will all be talking about their own projects over the next year as part of this. So I hope you'll come back and see more detail about what all the other artists uh, are doing as part of Multiplay. So let me just start my uh, PowerPoint. Oh, let's get back to the beginning here. Okay, so like Jerome, I want to acknowledge that I am on Treaty 4 territory. I'm presenting to you from my home remotely uh, on the traditional territories um, of the Nehiwak, Anishinaabeg, uh, Dakota, Lakota, Nakoda, and the homeland of the Métis uh, Midshift Nation. Uh, and it's very important to me as a uh, visitor in this space. I moved to Canada in 2009, to Saskatchewan in 2011. And so I'm learning so much. And I think there's so much work 
we all have to do if we're going to take very seriously any effort to decolonize, to work towards any kind of conciliation, reconciliation, and to genuinely deal with the injustices faced by Indigenous people daily uh, in Saskatchewan and across this nation state of Canada. I think that's very important context to the work I'm doing and continue to do. So what I'm going to do today is just talk a little bit about improvisation widely and the research I do in it, uh, and then for the second half concentrate on what we've been doing uh, with the Multiplay Project. And I really should acknowledge that the Multiplay Project is funded by the Canada Council for the Arts through the Digital Strategies Fund, very generous grant, and also through the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council through the International Institute for Critical Studies and Improvisation and our Regina Improvisation Studies Centre here on campus. So I want to start with this image. So this image is artists painting live in the foyer of the Royal Saskatchewan Museum as part of a project that I coordinated back in 2015 and 16 uh, in partnership with local artist collective Creative City Centre uh, and Indigenous contemporary art collective Segewawak. And the project was called Liquid Arts. So what you're seeing in this image is two paintings in progress by two emerging Indigenous artists, Larissa Kichimonia and Gina Dunbar. And they're creating these paintings live over the period of an afternoon in response to prompts, questions and ideas that are written on those little notes that you see at the bottom of the image there. And so the audience that I'm talking about are people who are just going to the museum anyway, but also people who are attending an event at the museum that was put on by the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy, Heritage Saskatchewan and SAS Culture, with contributions from a wide range of presenters. And I can see from the names of people attending today that some of the people who put on that event, presented at that event, or came to that event are here today. So you may remember this. Uh, so the topic of the event was living heritage, truth and reconciliation through the sharing of stories. And the event was described by the organizers as, quote, creating an opportunity for students, members of the general public, public sector employees and academics to participate actively in reconciliation of efforts through performance art, storytelling and public policy presentations. And how I got involved in this event was because I was working with the late and much missed jo uh, Dr. Joanna Piskinew at the time, uh, who was on the planning committee for organizing this event and she invited us to incorporate the liquid art project in some way. So the Liquid Art Project was mentoring emerging Indigenous uh, visual artists by providing them with opportunities to learn and to share their knowledge with others through improvised events, including painting live at concerts and conferences, uh, delivering improvised participatory workshops with schools, children, with teen mother programs, and attending mentorship sessions that were de um, delivered by cultural knowledge keepers and professional artists. So Lionel Payachu, Josh Goff, and Joseph Natalhau offered artistic and cultural mentorship, while the Creative City Centre, Segewawak, and the university supported the artists in professional development. And this project was funded through the Improvisation uh, Studies Centre. So the artists at the museum that day were inviting audience members to leave notes about what they were learning and what they were hearing at this event. We also had a range of children's books on the theme of reconciliation and on the legacies and histories of the residential school system. So families could sit together and read those books. Uh, we also had colouring sheets made out of the artist's other work uh, that people could colour along and join in on the creative process in the foyer. And the canvases that you see there were created, that were hung at a number of venues after that. Uh, and Joanne and I discussed them at the time as a different kind of visual arts knowledge emerging amongst all the other multiple forms of knowledge that were being shared by presenters at the museum that day. So the reason I'm starting with this image and this event is that it was the first time that I really saw the clear link between the work that artists do in the community and ideas of heritage. Before this moment, I was kind of aware that heritage work was about preserving history. I'd heard of it, the idea of intangible um, heritage, referring to histories that are embodied or in practices and knowledges rather than objects and things. But I hadn't really taken seriously the idea that art and living heritage might be terms that could be put into productive conversation. And it was also one of the first times that I started thinking that improvisation could be a form of living heritage. So improvisation is the center of the work that I do. Um, and when we talk about improvisation as artists, uh, we talk about getting together to make decisions in the moment that change what's happening, so in real time. 
We talk about collaboration and co-creation, the idea that the work is made out of multiple perspectives coming together. Uh, we talk about the need to actively and, ex and listen in an expanded fashion so that we can respond and create together. And of course, ideas of trust and risk become central. If we're going to co-create real time in the moment, uh, then we need to be able to find some way to trust each other and to create what we call supported risks. So risk taking, but with support. Uh, and then, of course, the best part of improvisation is the surprise. We don't know what's happening. We bring everything we have to that moment, all our training, all our professional experience, and yet everything will change and we will have to adapt. Uh, and the last part of improvisation that we talk a lot about is the idea that mistake and failure start looking very different. So what is a mistake? How can we build from a mistake into a new moment of production? How can we think of failure uh, differently? So in, I won't go too far into the research side, uh, but just to give you a little bit of framing around the work that I'm doing, uh, concepts from the research that can be useful when you're trying to imagine what this looks like. Uh, some researchers talk about improvisation as composing and performing at the same time. So you're making up what you're doing and you're doing it at the same time rather than pre-planning it, right? Uh, lots of scholars and artists think about it as a kind of free practice, right? But it's got constraints around it. And we want to build constraints that enable us rather than disable us. So those constraints might be ideas, themes, prompts that can get us going, but then what we do changes. Uh, they also are those constraints that we bring with us unconsciously, our language, our history, our background, our training. And again, how do we make these enabling to a co-created process rather than disabling uh, is the work of improvisation. Some scholars talk about improvisation as the most practiced and least studied part of art and music. I think that's less likely, uh, less uh, true now. Um, there's been a lot more research on this area over the years, the uh, last 10 years, for example. But it's certainly true that it's implicit in a lot of practice and not explicitly discussed. And another way that, uh, another frame that is useful when we're thinking about improvisation is the African-American saying to make a way out of no way. So that, that's the idea that we recombine, we remix, we work with what we have, uh, and we find solutions that weren't possible before. And this can be artistic solutions, how do we make the work we want to make, but it also starts to, um, to be social solutions. How do we work together? How do we take the work we're doing and do something with it? And obviously improvisation exists inside particular genres and styles. But I know we've got at least one jazz improviser in the audience today, uh, hip hop improvising, you know, classic piano improvising, all sorts of genres where you improvise within a certain set of expectations. There's also improvisation that attempts to work outside idioms, uh, what we call free improvisation. So how do I come to improvisation? Well, partly it's because I, my work is in the community and I'm interested in the relationship between improvised art practices, improvised social practices and how we build socially engaged art. Um, I'm also, and I think some of you attended George Lipset's talk last week, incredible Black Studies scholar from University of California who did a talk connected to the Improvisation Network. I'm very interested in what he talks about as arts-based community building. Um, so the idea that we can use improvised practice uh, to practice skills like empathy and discernment to bring about positive social change by uh, collaboratively working together. And I was lucky enough to get in on this kind of field of improvisation studies very early in my career. I did a postdoc at the University of Guelph uh, with the Improvisation Network. And it's a Canadian led area of research, critical studies and improvisation that's really grown and now has international sites uh, and practices uh, that I've been um, very lucky to be part of. And the other reason I'm kind of fascinated by uh, improvisation, and this is coming back to what Jerome said about our stupid silos we set up where we do our work and don't talk to other people, is I'm interested in how improvisation can talk across disciplines and across and between contexts. How can we find ways to bring people together that wouldn't come together or don't share common languages uh, to create new kinds of experiences that are positive? And this is really helpful for me in the field of art and technology, where I'm partnering with scientists and engineers who are improvising in their own ways, uh, and we need to find ways to bring these massively different disciplines together. And so there's a link to the Improvisation Studies Network, if you're interested in having a look at the wider field of critical studies improvisation, and the book that RJ and I edited um, 
in 2014 with Routledge, that was an attempt to bring together key texts from a different areas where they wouldn't normally be in conversation. So texts about uh, jazz improvisation, texts about visual arts improvisation, film improvisation, and put them into conversation with each other with some new pieces uh, by key scholars. So if you're interested, that's in the library. So what has all of this got to do with living heritage? <laughs> well, um, like uh, I think this quote has been shown before in some of the talks, this is a, a definition from UNESCO on what living heritage is uh, from their InFocus articles on safeguarding communities living heritage. So intangible cultural heritage refers to the practices, representations, expression, knowledge and skills handed down from generation to generation. This heritage provides communities with a sense of identity and the bold is mine here and is continuously recreated in response to their environment. It is called intangible because its existence and recognition depend mainly on the human will, which is immaterial and is transmitted by imitation and living experience. Intangible cultural heritage is also known as living heritage or living culture. So there's some fairly obvious ways in which we can see um, improvisation and, and, and these ideas of living heritage connecting very tightly. It's certainly very obvious in the work of um, musicians who are passing down um, skills and training from generation to generation. This is an image of uh, incredible Korean percussionist Don Won Kim, uh, who does traditional forms of improvised and com composed Korean music. Um, the instruments, the uh, practices of how to play them are carefully uh, passed down from generation to generation, but he's of course also adapting them and building from them. So that link seems fairly clear. But I also find links between heritage and, and living imp improv uh, improvisation and living heritage uh, in other fields uh, of improvised art practice. I'm quite aware that Charity Marsh is in the audience here and hip hop is her specialty, uh, but it has come into my research as well. Um, and this image is uh, of Australian hip hop artists that I work with um, uh, many years ago who are leaders in the field of, of global hip hop in terms of teaching people about hip hop, tying it back to its original roots in the US, but also uh, talking about its local specificity, uh, helping people to share stories and fight back against misrepresentations through improvised freestyle uh, rap, through improvised dance, through improvised music. So I find hip hop another kind of place where maybe these crossovers between improvisation and living heritage can happen. So I just want to read this quote by um, Indigenous hip hop artist MC Wire, a uh, really incredible uh, Australian hip hop artist. Uh, and he says, it's a modern day corroboree. And I don't know if people in Canada know this word corroboree. Uh, it's an Indigenous word from Australia for certain uh, groups in Australia that uh, it's a singing and storytelling and dance and cultural sharing practice has some parallels with power. So it's a modern day corroboree, actually. It's still the same corroboree, still singing and dancing and telling the same stories about the immediate environment. The reason I was attracted to it was the song and dance aspect because the culture I come from, the dream time, we always expressed our stories, our beliefs, our fears, our superstitions through song and dance. So being Abu digital in the 21st century, it was a natural evolution for me to move into hip hop and continue the corroboree. I'm Abo digital because I'm a 21st century Aboriginal. I'm down with laptops and mobile phones and home entertainment, but digital also means your hands and your fingers. I'm still putting my fingers in the dirt. I'm still using my hands to create things. I also think there's uh, some interesting questions to ask about improvisation and living heritage in more experimental forms. Uh, so this is, uh, is living heritage present in the work, say, of the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians, a Chicago um, avant-garde music uh, association that was teaching and mentoring youth um, to bring the traditions of African-American music making from throughout history to a brand new form of experimental improvised music. And those images, you see some of the kind of leading figures of avant-garde improvised music in the 20th and 21st century. I also think uh, living heritage is um, something we can consider when we think about improvised theatre. Uh, and so obviously some people will know about forum theatre or, uh, you know, forms where people are improvising with the audience to help try out new solutions. So the play stops and the audience tries things out. We see if we can come up with a problem This kind of forum theatre, theatre of the oppressed is used around the world. Um, or what Michelle Stewart and I have been 
roughly calling community improv, which is our use of improv games from a range of uh, backgrounds uh, with frontline organizations. So this is an image from a project uh, that Michelle Stewart and I did uh, with many partners, uh, including Jaden Pfeiffer and Johanna Bunden, amongst many others, uh, exploring uh, how improvised games from a range of traditions can be used for frontline organizations in peer support, family support, life skills training, and these are really focused around ideas of disability culture, disability support and disability justice uh, with these frontline organizations who are taking up improvisation and using it in frontline training contexts. Uh, is this living heritage is my question. So now I'll just do a little bit of a talk about the Multiplay project itself. Uh, so Multiplay was funded in 2018 to run 2019 to 2021. I think the pandemic is going to probably mean we're still doing activities through to 2022. Uh, and it's a project um, that brings together a, a range of artists and partners um, uh, through improvisation and digital uh, tools. You can have a look at the website there, multiplay.ca. It's a placeholder right now. I was kind of hoping the new one would be launched by today. Uh, but it's still got a few uh, edits happening. But the new, the new website will launch very shortly that will have a lot more detail. At the moment, uh, you will just see a, a kind of summary on there. So the premise of the Multiplay project uh, was to use digital tools to connect isolated regional Canadian sonic performance and new media artists who all use improvisation in their work with each other and with the public and find new digital means to support ongoing ethical artist and community collaborations in improvised arts practice. That's very good grant speak there. What that boils down to is that all of the artists that are in this project are interested in sharing improvised art with the public and or in some cases both improvising with communities using these new kinds of digital tools that are available. And so the artists invo involved include youth and community guest artists and participants and staff and family. Uh, and then there are um, a group of artists all leading different sub projects. Uh, so myself, Michelle Stewart, uh, University of Regina, a researcher and uh, creative professional, James Harley, who is a uh, composer and a musician um, at University of Guelph, John Campbell, who's a local Regina independent artist who's building uh, kinetic sculptures, sculptures that move. Uh, Helen Pridmore, who's here today, uh, a vocalist. Uh, Holophon Audio Artists Arts, which is a fantastic local collective of experimental audio um, practitioners. And Michael Waterman, a radio artist who's based in Ottawa. And we have this huge kind of range of partners working with us. I won't read them all, uh, but some of them are funding us. Some of them are co-creating projects with us. Uh, some of them are providing venues for talks and uh, exhibitions. Um, and some of them are uh, uh, places where um, work will continue to be shared as we go forward with the project. So let me give you the very quick summary of the sub projects and then I'll come back to the work that I am doing and Living Heritage. So there's lots of them. So I'll just give you a quick summary. Like I said, you can come back and hear about what the artists are doing uh, when they do their own talks. So Sonic Blankets is the project that Michelle Stewart, James Harley and I are running uh, with uh, families in Regina and Saskatoon uh, and students and postdocs in Regina and Guelph. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's mostly around sound and improvised music. Yukon Wanderers is a project that Michelle and I are partnering with uh, supported living uh, and support organizations up in Whitehorse in the Yukon. 20 Games in 20 Days was a fun side project. We were driving up to Whitehorse, so we decided along the way to cache, use geocaching. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's a, a, a like a treasure hunting with a GPS device. And so we geocached improvisation games and scores all the way along the road from Regina up to Whitehorse. And people have been finding these and uh, with their geocache uh, the systems. Uh, recognition. Here's John Campbell's project. So like I said, he's a kinetic sculptor who likes to make things that move. He's working with facial recognition right now. So how, you know, software recognizes our emotions and uh, makes assumptions about us. And so he's creating sculptures where the camera will look at your face, make a decision, and then the sculpture will move in response. And he wants to bring the public in to have conversations about surveillance, about privacy, about AI, uh, and get people to have a chance at making sculptures themselves. Uh, Michael Waterman's Radio Ryzen project. 
So he's improvising on the radio and inviting people to join in and creates these live improvised um, sessions. He's been doing this for many years. And as part of this project, he's creating exhibitions, public engagement sessions. He was a res artist in resident with CJTR FM, uh, their plein air series. And so he's doing all sorts of ways to bring people into this um, experimental radio practice. So Nia and Yetzer Ba is Helen Pridmore's project, uh, and she is um, exploring ideas of voice and working with uh, partners, um, including the wonderful Astonished program. Uh, let me just find how they define themselves as, quote, an inclusive community where young adults with complex physical disabilities can name their dreams and explore their strengths. So along with the Voice Lab uh, Research Institute at the University of Regina, Helen's been exploring how improvised voice and uh, can be explored uh, with this community uh, using all sorts of different tools. And she's also uh, doing live streams of concerts and exploring other technologies for sharing uh, improvised voice. And Workshops for Prairie Sound Artists is the Holophon Audio Arts project, and they've been running some pretty fantastic uh, projects, inviting people in to come and play with some of the new technologies that are available for working with sound and audio, including new kinds of microphones, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, and so there's many more workshops to come. If you're interested in this, you should come along. And then we have all these artist talks and festival appearances and exhibitions, some of which have been funded by other funding bodies in connection with the Multiplay project. And then uh, next year we'll be having a Multiplay hackathon, which hopefully you will all come to, uh, where we're bringing the artists and community together to see what we can make using a hackathon format, which comes really from computer science uh, and seeing what artists and communities can build uh, in a short amount of time in groups. And we're also producing an app that will share some of the work that's happening in the communities. So my last few minutes, I'm gonna talk about what is the relationship between the Multiplay Project and ideas of living heritage. And so the first thought I had is heritage can be improvised in the present moment. We can use improvisation to share new kinds of lived experiences. So for example, in the Sonic Black Blankets Project, in this project, young people are learning to improvise music using fidget devices that they use in their everyday life to stay calm. They're recording sounds in the environment they love and noticing sounds that they don't like uh, so that they can share ideas about dealing with sensory difference. They're also co-creating new wearable projects to help them think about how placing sound on their bodies might help regulate um, and calm. So they're also learning to advocate for their own needs uh, as people with different sensory profiles. And there's just some examples of pictures from our workshops, James Harley, uh, Michelle Stewart, uh, and some of the young people involved uh, visiting Stacey Bliss, our postdoc uh, research fellow. And we were exploring, uh, playing with fidgets, seeing what we could do with multi-channel sound, with recorders, with microphones. On the right there, you see we moved virtually when COVID happened and started doing workshops online. And there's one with uh, Gawi J, my PhD student, and Brandon Watson, uh, MFA student, with, a, with one of the young people and her family, Keisha and her mother, seeing some of the wearable projects that we've co-created in the workshops. And there's some uh, images of Keisha exploring the university and the sounds of the university. And on the right there with James Harley showing her fidget devices and thinking what music you could make with them. And her summary, Keisha's summary. So this is a 12 year old participant in the project youth artist, collaborator, co-creator. Hi, my name is Keisha Rain Moore. I live with something called FASD. Nobody can change that. To be honest, I love living with FASD. It makes me special and different. I still do ordinary things anyone would do. I play hockey, go to school, even get in a little mischief once in a while. That's who I am, smiley face. My favorite part about this project is the way my body felt during the project was amazing. I felt like I was in my happy place and actually being understood. It was an incredible experience. I love it. And so the young people involved are currently deciding what out of all of these workshops they would like to share with the public. Uh, and then we'll be putting those things onto the website, their music and improvisations. And we're also hoping we can have some live performances uh, if COVID lets us. The second point is 
you know, improvisation, while we talk about its possibilities and its um, social possibilities, it's not always positive, right? People improvise. For, uh, if you think of things like improvised explosive devices, that's not a positive way of, of improvising, working with what you have to create something that will cause harm. Uh, you know, lots of people improvise in order to avoid responsibility and be adaptable to situations. It's not inherently positive. Uh, so like improvisation, I argue that heritage can be simultaneously positive and negative. And we might need, we might want to hold on to things, not because we want to celebrate them, but because we want to learn from them, heal from them, witness them. Um, but like improvisation, it can also be simultaneously positive and negative. So positive things may be occurring and also negative things um, being exposed. So with the Yukon Wanderer project, this is the project up in Whitehorse that Michelle and I are doing. Folks are doing all sorts of improvisations with the space that they wander through. Uh, so it's improvised site-specific creative exercises and explorations. We're drawing from some of the theatre games that we used in Improv Enable, from music exercises, theatre, visual anthropology, which is Michelle Stewart's uh, area, and visual art in terms of digital photography, GPS, drawings, uh, ways of tracking how people wander, why they wander, and what we can learn from how folks wander. Uh, then when COVID happened, again, we couldn't be face to face, we started sharing sounds and photos back and forth in an in improvising response to each other using social media. So uh, they would send a photo, Michelle would send a photo back, they would send a sound, I would send a sound back. And we're building up content together that we might improvise with, but we're also kind of sharing our daily lives together. But along the way, what's happening is that we're learning positive and negative realities of lived experience for these folks um, living uh, with disability stigma and injustice in their lives, learning how to be artists and be creative. And we've also adapting together constantly. The project changes constantly as we adapt to the lived and daily realities of folks uh, living in these situations. So there's just some images of wandering in white horse together, sound walking, taking pictures. Um, and so these kind of uh, practices that might expose and share positive and negative heritage. And the last one I want to talk about is that improvisation can look backward and forward at the same time. It can imagine new strategies for the future, even as it's maybe talking about the past. And so this uh, example here, this is a, um, if you just search uh, OFI video, you'll, you'll get this channel. This is the Options for Independence in Whitehorse uh, video channel. And what happened is we'd left some iPads up there for the project. When lockdown happened, people picked up those iPads and started interviewing each other about what it was like to live in lockdown with COVID. And these are consummate improvisers. These are people who have to improvise every day to deal with constantly changing circumstances, where funding's coming from, uh, uncertain living, uncertain economic status. So they're really good improvisers already in social terms. And so they are sharing their experiences, their tactics and their daily lives living in lockdown in a supported living environment. And these videos uh, were made just, we didn't teach video. It wasn't one of the art skills we shared. They picked up the iPad, started videoing. And then my student Gowie J and I helped them to edit those into videos. Uh, really, we did no editing. We just put a frame on them. Uh, and they're these really important stories of this lived experience that's happening now that we will probably want to later learn about. And I know other people have talked about this, uh, that these experiences, we, we look forward and imagine, oh, we may want to remember what it was like for people to try to do this very strange circumstance that we're in right now. And the last example of looking forward is the multiplay collective. So we never expected this to happen, but lots of the artists who couldn't do the work they wanted to do started wanting to improvise together. And John Campbell came up with this solution, which is we all improvise from our homes, uh, but we do it so that each of us is on a different laptop and he uses a 360 degree camera to then film us all improvising together. Uh, and those immersive 360 degree um, videos are available and will be on the Multiplay website for you to feel like you're in there with us improvising. And uh, this has been an experiment. We're trying out online music um, technologies for live sound. Uh, and on the right there is the Oculus Quest, which is a uh, VR headset. And we're going to use the VR headset in exhibitions to share as much as possible of the Multiplay project using this 360 idea that we can create immersive environments where people feel like they are there uh, with the people and the artists. And so that's the question that I want to leave with. How can improvising help us imagine new kinds of sharing what is important to us towards a new understanding of who we are, where we come from and where we want to go? 
and I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, if you want to uh, move your hands and slide around the cameras for a minute to uh, thank uh, Rebecca uh, for her presentation. So I'll um, uh, say a few words while uh, you all think about your questions. It's a good time. We have a good uh, uh, 25 minutes now to um, have a discussion, not just a question and answer if you want to. Um, while you're all still here, I do want to um, uh, announce the next uh, uh, the next uh, session we'll have. Um, Carol Lafayette Boyd from the Saskatchewan African Canadian Heritage Museum will be uh, presenting on November 18th on um, the museum and um, some of the work it's doing. So I'll put a link in the chat here um, for registration and that will get to you in other ways as well. So what we'll be doing is just a simple question and answer period to start with. Um, you can use the little hands um, on the participant list if you want. Uh, you can ask your questions in the chat. Um, you can also uh, just let me know that you have a question to ask. You can do it in the chat. And if you want to respond to what's being said at this moment, you can tell me in the chat, I would like to respond to this. And then we can actually get a discussion going as opposed to having a kind of a fragmented uh, back and forth here. So the floor is yours here. Would you like to ask uh, Rebecca? While you're thinking, I'll ask a question and then uh, I'll, uh, oh, Alex has a, has a question, even better. Sorry, it took, it took me a while. Uh, fascinating talk, Rebecca, thank you so much. Uh, improvisation, again, very, very interesting topic. Not one that's in part of my background, uh, formally at least not. But I'm wondering, um, now that you've brought improvisation into the context of heritage and, and living heritage, um, I wonder what's the difference between improvisation and performativity? Because, I mean, I mean I'm not just thinking performance, but performativity especially, mm -hmm. where uh, history really exists only in my perception of it, and that's always in the moment, right? Mm -hmm. And I can only perceive it through an act of performance, or in this case, I'm performing it into place. Mm -hmm. So it's not all um, consumption of historical ideas or of the past a form of improvisation. Thanks, what an awesome question. Well, you can tell immediately that I have a performance studies background because <laughs> I'm nodding completely to everything you're saying there uh, in terms of performance being a way in which we understand the world. That That's something that makes sense to me. But I would say that the difference is that in improvisation, we're co-creating with others. Uh, and so that in that co-creation moment, we are having to share distributed control in ways that we maybe aren't as willing to do in other circumstances. And so it's a, it's, there is both performativity in terms of unconscious activity happening that is performing through our bodies, uh, but there's also conscious choices of back and forth, of response, of listening, of waiting to hear what's happening and then changing what you were going to do. And I think those are in conversation together uh, when improvisation takes place, like like I said, the constraints sometimes that we bring to an improvisation are sometimes unconscious ones we're not actually aware of, but they often become exposed when we improvise together, right? It's very difficult for me to improvise with other improvisers without them realizing very fast that English is the only language I speak, for example, or that I have a gender presentation as a female that I, that I will present myself as. And these things are going to uh, inform what I can do. So I think that that makes it slightly different from all performance, this kind of co-creation co either with each other or with environments that change or with technologies that specifically change what we were planning to, to go about doing. I don't know if you think that's a satisfying answer. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> that's a great question. And I think that probably improvisation and performance need to always be discussed together, right? Because we're in this live, live, <laughs> live in many different senses moment uh, with represent, represented, uh, represented um, things that we have brought to the table. But like I said, you then have to let them go uh, when they're not the right thing, which makes it fairly different. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Who else has questions for Rebecca? Or discussions to get started based on what she presented? Okay, I will ask the question then. 
Um, I was wondering um, if you can give us some examples, if you've seen this happen, of people who, who do wildly improvise, draw on uh, living heritage, and who draw on these, these uh, traditions, these, uh, um, these the different uh, either uh, art forms or um, um, knowledges, right, that, that they bring along with them. Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that, like I said, when I, I brought up Don Juan Kim and the, the, the traditional, the passing down of traditional ways of playing instruments, that's a clear and obvious connection, right? But I think that uh, in, say, hip hop, for example, I've witnessed people who are talking about their everyday experience, and they're also talking about their histories and heritages of how they got there. And so it's a different kind of living heritage, right? So for example, uh, uh, Morganics, the artist I mentioned earlier, working with young teenage teenagers in uh, an area in Australia, they're talking about um, their daily practice of going down to the river and swimming. But in the lyrics of the hip hop and the mov movement and the, the, the art, we also see the heritage of the stolen generation of Indigenous children being taken away. We also see the heritage of the history of the river and how important it is to the cultural practices of those people. Um, and so inside this one hip hop track, we might get all of these layers of history happening, right? So the, the cultural histories, the recent histories, the everyday now moments and how they all inform each other. That's one example that comes to mind immediately. Um, but also, I think in the work that Michelle and I are doing with people um, and organizations and families who are advocating for justice for disability uh, in disability contexts, there's a lot of lived survival tactics that people pass on to each other. How do you cope with what has happened? How did your parents cope with what has happened? If there are, uh, you know, something like fetal alcohol spectrum disorder that's such a stigmatized and misunderstood disability, right? Where we blame mothers for drinking and then we blame children for having a disability that's that was not their fault then we don't treat it the same as other disabilities and we expect people to uh, act in ways that they that that are outside what they can do it's really very um it's very problematic and so the ways in which you survive in those circumstances are passed on through sharing with others and that's what we saw again and again in the workshops is people sharing how they advocated for themselves or how their strategies of of trying to you know produce new kinds of of ways of being together and disability culture is so it's its own culture right and inside these these places people are finding their own ways of being together that we don't know about unless we allow that 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 uh remove some of those barriers right that are stopping people from being able to live and share that lived lived knowledge together so that that's another another place I see it happening a lot is kind of tactics and strategies for survival you know well thanks so far I think it's it's, a, um, it's important to be able to talk about living heritage beyond the way that uh, UNESCO approaches it uh, that we don't remain uh, too uh, constrained by, by their framework and, and their goals and their ends. I've thought about this similar uh, situations around immigration, where a lot, a lot of, of those, that, that, that knowledge, that culture uh, is passed on within communities. Um, and so we have another great example here of how living heritage can, it is passed on and isn't limited to, um, uh, to these, uh, these uh, very, very long standing traditions. Well, uh, Jerry. I was just going to add to that that the the readaptation of those traditions is part of what we talk about when we talk about living heritage, right? We don't crystallize a culture in 1600 and then pass it on forevermore exactly the same. It's constantly adapting and changing, but we're bringing with us some of the knowledges from the past. That's where I think an idea of improvisation can be useful because uh, it's, again, when we improvise, we can't leave behind our history's experiences training, right? It's coming with us, <laughs> but we also adapt and create some new so it's allowing both of those to coexist I think in a way that sometimes uh, archival understandings of heritage for example uh, maybe don't go ahead the attorney oh hi thanks so much Rebecca the there are just so many uh you're, the interweaving of all the projects and thinking across all of these different um disciplines and art forms uh, it's it's just really lovely to see it so neatly packaged and, and given to us so we can see it in a way that it's because i i know just how messy these things actually <laughs> Um, so thank you so much. But I, I also want to I want to come back and I actually you ended up talking a little bit about when the questions I was going to say just in that response. And I think, you know, uh, one of the things that we can 
at times get caught up, caught up with is this notion of like, when we see, especially, I mean, looking at that hip hop example, uh, uh, young youth engaged in these sort of uh, contemporary practices, but combining or thinking about histories, legacies, thinking about um, experiences and tradition and practices that are very meaningful uh, and, and coming in. And I'm wondering about that. I think this is for me one of the reasons I'm so drawn to improvisation and thinking about improvised critical studies in, in improvisation in this kind of way. And I, I was wondering if you could, um, we, um, sorry, I got caught in my own mind. <laughs> we get caught up in that idea of like uh, this, these containing these things. And I remember initially when I started to, to do the research around hip hop, one of the things that I um, we was often challenged or talked about was part of the dialogue was, well, what, what are communities thinking about um, these kinds of contemporary practices becoming involved and, and how, how do they work? And I think one of the, the rich parts of this is around like how young people are engaged in, uh, in presenting their lived experience in these very in-between kinds of places of present and past, mm -hmm. especially for, uh, you know, Indigenous youth here in Saskatchewan, for example, and what it means to look what what it looks like living in this sort of in this environment today. And so I'm wondering about that in relation to how improvisation and in, in thinking about heritage, how it can do uh, or how we can think about it as a sort of larger model. Mm -hmm. And you started talking about that. And I'm wondering now that you're on this path, if you can see it be within other kinds of arts practices and in that kind of way yeah sorry that was very convoluted but no it's <laughs> great uh i'm a long time like back in 2009 when i first uh, do my postdoc with the improvisation network i started getting very fascinated with the idea of time and i wrote about a phrase that came up at a, an event in guelph someone said oh, it's so great. Improvisation takes people out of their daily lives for a minute, right? They can do something fun and they can feel like they're not connected. And someone in the audience put up their hand and said, nope, I think it puts them back in time. It gives them back their histories, their cultures, their abilities to represent themselves and decide what they are. And that was a very powerful statement. And I've, I keep coming back to that, right? That if we can create, co-create in the present, perhaps we can give back some of the time um, that we don't get to consider our histories and where we come from and who we are, right? Maybe those are the things that we can create space for uh, through improvisation so that we can be honest about these histories and cultures and practices that we bring to the table and see what we can build together, right? So I just, I found that really interesting. And I, I, def, I wrote about that in terms of MC Wire and the work that he did. Um, you know, where he talks about hip hop being a modern day corroboree, because it's a very different reading than hip hop in Australia is because people in America did something and Australians copied it, right? It's a very different understanding. Actually, what he's talking about is we are building our culture continually. <laughs> we didn't stop in, you know, when the settlers arrived. And this is another way in which we build our histories and hold on to our histories. So I think that's, that's a really powerful idea. I can just go if that's all right. Yeah. Um, hi, thank you so much for, for this talk. And you had so much packed into that presentation, but it was all very um, great to follow along with. I have kind of two, two questions. Um, one being, were these projects developed with community input or how were they? Absolutely. That's the answer. <laughs> but yes, I can explain how if you like. <laughs> but yeah, they're all created with community uh, co-creation. And that's why I always feel so very weird. And I know other socially engaged artists feel the same uh, talking about this work because you always feel like you're claiming it as yours when actually it's not yours at all. You've co-created it with other people and they own it and they co-created the ideas that run it, right? So it's definitely not my work. It's co-created work. And I was really happy that some of the artists are here here, Helen's here, John's here, uh, James Harley's here. I'm not sure if Michelle made it, but there's lots of folks from the project here um, who would have a totally 
different way of thinking about it. And then the communities themselves are running the projects that make sense for what they're doing at the moment that they want to work on. And we're, just, we're coming in and supporting and collaborating and adding to the work that they're doing, right? So instead of like, hey, Whitehorse, how about we bring you a project? Actually, what are you already doing there? How can we support it? And so this these two projects that Michelle and I are running, one in Regina, one in Whitehorse, they both emerged out of work we were already doing with partners to support what they were already doing. So in Whitehorse, you know, options for independence, the supported living environment, they've been wanting to do creative projects for ages and they've been trying to find ways to do it. Um, uh, and FASI, our other partner up there, they've been supporting folks who are living in all these uh, very transient ways and thinking about the creative potential that all these folks are having and not getting a chance to explore. And so there was already an interest in that. There was already an interest in improvisation. Uh, there was already people using improvisation in the in the tra in training in frontline ways. And so it it fit with what they needed and what they wanted, right? And so then always, like I said, it's constantly adapting the White House project. We had a totally different vision of how it was going to work, but it's changed completely, right? Because of what the partners need, what's happening on the ground up there. Um, yeah, nobody expected COVID. <laughs> nobody expected, you know, constantly changing um, work possibilities for participants where their jobs disappear and suddenly they've got no money. Like everything change, changes all the time. And so the co-creation part is also um, at the design portion, right? We're improvising at the design end as well as the art practice. We're improvising as a coalition of people trying to build something together. I don't know if that is enough detail for you, but I'd be happy to talk about it anytime if you're interested in more on how we make them. Yeah, well, my secondary question was just how, like, um, how were those particular communities the ones that you were going to engage with, like not because yeah. they weren't chosen, it seems. But no, how that's a great question. And it's a very, uh, and socially engaged artists, community based artists uh, will have many responses to this question because I started doing work with my communities about things that mattered to me. And then I started getting invited to work with other people. And that's complicated, right? Because then you're in other people's spaces and you're doing things that are not yours. Um, and so that's been a process of learning all the way along, how do we build things together that I can offer any value to what they're already trying to do? Uh, how can I come in and support what communities need and are wanting, right? And so that's, that's how I, and sometimes that looks like art education. Sometimes that looks like co-building a theater show together. Sometimes that looks like process driven stuff where we may not present anything to the public at the end. Uh, and that has to be de decided, the form has to be decided with people based on what they need rather than what I need. And so funding often gets complicated because you'll tell a grant that you're going to do something <laughs> and then you'll go work with the community and realize that's not what they want to do and I, we got it wrong at the grant stage. And so it's always just that, again, improvising and adapting, uh, you know, again, like this project was supposed to finish in the middle of next year. I think it's probably going to finish in 2022. I am fully expecting to see very different things by the end than what we planned, right? Because the communities need different things and things come up that are different to what we expected. I don't know if Helen is still here and wanted to talk about that, but I know she has had all sorts of thoughts around improvising with communities and her partners um, that have changed, hey, Helen, over the time. Yes, well, thanks for including me. I won't take up too much time, but yeah, um, I've been working uh, regularly with these uh, fine folks at the Big Sky Center for Learning and Being Astonished. And uh, we were doing various projects that got shut down because of the COVID pandemic, but also because the project actually didn't suit them. It didn't work. My initial concept for it didn't work. So uh, then we've moved on to different ways of, of working together, one of which of course has to be working online. So yeah, we're adapting and improvising as we go along. And I still, I'm not sure we've got it right yet, but we're having fun trying. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, George. Yeah. I think you stopped. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. It was a very uh, intellectual talk. Um, my question, uh, I'm just going to reference back to uh, you mentioning something about um, cultural culture changes mm -hmm. and pre-Columbian 
in Canada, the culture pretty much remained the same for about 20, 40,000 years, depending on uh, the art history of and the pictographs that we see that's been referenced through anthropological sciences. I could also use, oh, Egyptian culture has been pretty much the same for about 5,000 years prior to the development of the European countries. So my question for you is that in improvisation, are there any drivers that would affect the amount that's, um, not the amount, the, um, I guess the emotional drivers that would affect the improvisation if a culture was to meet another culture? Oh, small question. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not completely sure I agree with you that culture remains static, even if the forms of production look similar over a long period of time, because we do understand that 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 culture is produced by people pr producing so circles of meaning together. Uh, so I'm not completely sure I, I agree with the premise that some cultures stay static because I just don't I don't think that's true. Uh, but I will agree with you that it's uh, it, that that moment of connection between a, a culture that has been using a certain form for a long time of, of ways of making meaning hitting a culture that doesn't follow or understand or do that. Uh, and, you know, the results of that can be fairly uh, dramatic. Um, and I think there are a lot of people doing work on this, uh, on this idea of improvisation and intercultural communication. Um, so I, I would direct you to have a look at some of their work because that's not my specialty. Um, but my first thought on that question um, is that sometimes what happens, I think, when cultures come together uh, is assimilation and genocide. And sometimes what happens when cultures come together is the ability for difference to coexist. And I think that for Canada, for example, we need to find that second model. We need to find the way for differences to coexist, but we can't do it by throwing commonality out the window. We can't do it by saying we have totally different experiences and we'll never understand each other. We need to be able to find a way to both be able to understand and learn from each other's culture and allow difference to actually exist and, and be supported. Uh, because I don't know about you, but I feel like it's vitally important that I am allowed to be different. And so if I need to be different, then I need to support other people's ability to be different too, right? There's a moral responsibility there. But that idea that cultures can coexist and that improvisation might be the way in which we can move across and between these very big differences that separate us, that's inspiring to me. Um, but it's, um, it's not my research area. Um, but I think a lot of people are interested in that exact question you're asking, right? And I think a lot of people have asked, especially um, uh, in um, ethnomusicology and in, uh, well, critical studies improvisation in general, looking at, um, forms that are specifically emerging out of, you know, settler colonial states, example, opposed to people who are trying to track older forms, right, that are maybe less known about and less understood or erased or hidden. Uh, and so I think there's people doing both, right? I think there's people looking at how cultures now can try and deal with that moment of difference and clash. But I think there's also people trying to uh, uncover, track, and, um, and, ex and kind of be able to talk about older forms of improvised practice. And I'm thinking here, Indigenous uh, People's Health Research Center, have, we're doing a project for a long time about gathering Indigenous uh, improvisation models and games and being able to share with them. So this sort of traditional and hidden knowledge that we haven't learned about because it's oral and, and we, we don't share it, <laughs> um, that, or that's getting erased uh, by cultural genocide. So there's this kind of, um, there's this kind of recovery project, if you like, where I think a lot of people are trying to track those different forms that are not happening now out of these kind of multicultural Western countries, but in other places. Uh, so I'm excited about the field because I think the more that we have that knowledge, the more that we are all going to be able to see real different approaches to this idea, you know. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, everyone, for your um, your uh, questions, your, your your comments, the this discussion here. Great comments in the chat as well. Unfortunately, I do try to stick to the uh, one to two uh, window pretty uh, strictly. Um, um, I see there's a few more questions still, so uh, you know how to get a hold of Re Rebecca to continue the conversation. Please uh, thank do. You for, <laughs> for being here today. 
Um, uh, our next um, uh, our next uh, event will be on November 18th uh, with uh, Carol La 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 Lafayette Boyd. Um, um, and um, I'm going to wish you all a great afternoon and hopefully we'll see you in a month or so.